Give Jesus the biggest hand clap you've ever given anyone. Celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for what you have already done. We thank you for what you are about to do. And we thank you also for what you are doing even right now in our mess. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. And we give you all the praise. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Father, I ask... Because I know that your word is already anointed. So I ask you, O Lord, that may you anoint these lips of clay as your word comes out of my mouth. For your word declares that your word shall not return to you void, but it would accomplish every purpose by which it has been sent to accomplish. So I thank you for the manifestation of your word. I thank you that your word shall be back with action. And everyone that is here would know that indeed you are alive and you live forevermore. We thank you in Jesus' name. People of God said amen. amen. May you be seated, please. Um, I want to play, first of all, I want to say congratulations for coming out on Monday night. Thank you. Know, God bless you. God has wonderful things he has for you. Your coming is not by accident. But God has ordained this time to do something wonderful in your life. And you are going to leave with a testimony in the name of Jesus. I want to play a video from our last crusade. Um, We did a crusade in March, which we saw God do wonderful things. So I just want to show you um, just a little clip of the crusade and what God did. And I don't know if the, the media team has the video ready. You don't have it. Where's my wife? Did she run out, run away again? She's outside? All right. Okay. My wife is not here. We'll play the video when she comes. Um, who is excited or who is anticipating for what God has for them tonight? I feel joy. I feel joy in my spirit because yeah. I have an expectation for something great from the Lord tonight. Amen. And I know God has, God did not assemble this meeting for nothing, but there is something that God wants to do in your life and God is going to do it in your life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want you, if you will, turn your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 3. I'm going to preach tonight on a message I've entitled, which this message dropped in my spirit. Oh, Penel. This message dropped in my spirit whilst we were driving here. So um, I'm going to preach it. It's a fresh message I'm going to preach it. So I'm learning whilst I preach it. (laughs) Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I'm going to read from the verse number 1. And this, I call it faith to receive your miracle. The Bible said in Acts chapter 3, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. Can somebody get my wife so that because I, the testimonies I asked of her, I need it. Where's my wife? They have the videos? Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer. The ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gates of the temple. At the gates of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. 
So this man was born lame, laid at a temple, saw Peter and John going to the temple. He probably identified that these are men that had walked with Jesus. Or she prob probably heard of the testimonies that was going on or heard of what was going on in Jerusalem. So the Bible said, oh, he was just asked anybody he saw for money. So probably didn't even know who they were. And he saw them and he said, hey, can you give me money? I don't think Peter and John didn't have money to give the guy. But I, what I think it was that they realized that money was not the answer to his problem. You know, there are many people that go, are going through situations that they have the money to pay for it. They have all the money in the world. I remember I was in a car with a, a man, a very rich man. He's a multi, multi billionaire. You know, and I don't want to go too. I don't want to go too much into details what he does. Matter of fact, he's not a multi billionaire. He's a multi. No, yeah, he's a multi billionaire. Yep, he's worth roughly around ten billion dollars, maybe on the low. Very wealthy man. You know, at some point, their family used to own. 1,900 buildings, properties across America. That is how rich they are. And as I was sitting in the car, you know, he's not a Christian. As I was sitting in the car with him, he said to me, if you could promise me divine health, I will give you all the money you want in this world. If you can promise me health. So you realize that there are things in, the, in life that money cannot buy. So the man has been sitting at the gate called Beautiful for many years. Asking for arms, and I probably, people give them money. People give them money. You meet a, a blind man begging for money on the side of the road. People give them money because people are very generous. And Peter and John saw the man. They've probably seen him because the Bible says that he sat at the gate daily. And maybe instances in their life, maybe times in their life, they've given the man money before. Because the Bible says that they went to the temple daily and prayed. Or they were actually, matter of fact, they were on their way for their daily 9 a.m. prayer meetings. So it wasn't the first time they went there. And it wasn't the first time the man was sitting there. So they probably have encountered a the man. They probably given the man money before. And they realized that money wasn't what he needed. Money would not solve his problem. So Peter and John Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for arms. Okay, I'm going to continue reading the scripture. I just want to play this video because I want to give you an idea of what we do and what this whole ministry is about. So just go ahead and watch the video. Official has been in the news for many different things. But no matter what is going on in this town, the blood of Jesus Christ is enough to wash clean of his soul. See, Jesus came to seek you out. Jesus came and died for you. See, the devil wants you to die for him, but Jesus died for you. He died on the cross for you that you don't have to become a slave to sin. The Bible says that anyone that sin is a slave to sin. So you no longer have to be a slave for sin. Jesus came to set you free. The Bible says that for whom the Son set free is absolutely free indeed. But tonight you might have come here with some bondages. You might have come here maybe imprisoned by the devil. You might have been imprisoned by a curse. You might have been imprisoned by sickness and disease. You might have been imprisoned by poverty. But Jesus Christ is here tonight. This lady's left leg was in excruciating pain. When she would walk, she said that it would shake constantly and it would be in pain. But after the preaching, she has been healed by the Holy Ghost. young man has been in and out of the hospital. He, his heart was failing him. As you were praying, he couldn't even walk here. So he came with people, healed, healed, and glory be to God. Somebody give Jesus a shout of praise.
must believe that though it might be impossible with men, with God all things are possible. He says that I am the Lord God. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything that God cannot do? You think your doctors can help you, but God cannot help you? You think that the politicians can help you, but God cannot help you? Jesus Christ! He is the same yesterday. He is the same today. And he is the same forever. So, I am here as part of the people you prayed for who have been practiced fetish here. She said that after the prayer, she was a witch doctor. She is free and she can feel it. She used the word, I am free. I command you to receive your healing now by the stripes of Jesus. Be healed. Be healed. Let your weakness be turned into strength. I command every deaf ears to come open. Let every blind eye be healed. Let every tumor disappear. I take authority over the spirit of infirmity. Devil, lose your hold over their life. Oh, power of God. Power of the Holy Ghost. Let the fire of God fall upon you now hallelujah. hallelujah so all the people you saw dancing on the on the screen were people that had received received a touch from God during those meetings matter of fact the lady that was wearing the yellow dress she was bent over like this and that's how she walked and the Power of God touched her and she stood up straight. So when you saw her dancing the way she was dancing, she wasn't dancing because the music was so good. She was dancing because God had God set her free. Amen. 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 Faith to receive your miracle. There is certain things you must understand or certain things you must know to prepare you to receive that which God had promised us in his word. The Bible says that Peter and John were on their way to the temple called Beautiful for their 9 o'clock, 9 a.m. regular daily prayers. And when the man saw them, the man asked them for arms. Verse 4. And the Bible says, and fixing his eyes on him, with John, fixing his eyes on him, with John and Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. You know, he said, look at us. So he said, oh man, this man is about to give us a big check. Expecting to receive something from them. So next verse. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. I want you to pay attention to this message very well, because I'm not going to preach long. I'm going to be very short, but very strong, and then I'm going to minister to you. Amen. Amen. So he gave them attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So you see, Peter and John met the man who was in need of healing. The man had been lame from birth. The man had been crippled from birth. And the man needed healing. But before they healed him, they announced what they had in their possession. Let me tell you this. There is different types of people. There is different types of ministries. There is different types. The Bible talks about he gave gifts unto man. He gave, you know, there is different administrations. You read um, um, 2 Corinthians. The Bible talks about the gift of the Spirit and all that. There are people, by faith, by faith, any believer can minister healing. That is a fact. Any believer. Somebody asked me yesterday, um, or some yeah yesterday. How did you know, when did you know that you had the gift of healing? And now I I want to help everybody, so I didn't tell him oh this and that, but I told him that any believer can minister healing. That is what the scripture says. Because when you preach faith, 
into the hearts of the people. And faith comes alive in them. They can receive that which God has promised them. But God also has given special gifts to men. The difference between a believer preaching faith and ministering in faith and somebody who is gifted with the gift of healing is that one does it effortlessly where it is not by mind, it's not by power, but it's by the hand of the almighty God. It is very, very important that before you minister healing, there has to be an announcement that is made from heaven. An announcement that is made to the people who you are, what you have, and what you carry. Sometimes it might sound to the, peop- to the, uns- to the person or it might sound to people um, you are prideful or who do you think you are. But that is the truth. Peter announced, he says, silver and gold we do not have. But there is something that I have. That in the name, I have the name of Jesus to break the sickness and the curse over your life. See, Jesus in Luke chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, verse number 18. Luke chapter 4. Verse number 18, Jesus announced. He says that for the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus announced that the spirit of God was upon him, that he was, he had been granted a special grace to minister healing to those that need it. When you announced the gifts or the manifestations of the Holy Ghost in your life, what you are doing is that you are helping the people to set their expectation because now they know that there is somebody who has the ability to help them. That is why it is very, very important That before you minister healing, you must announce that you are anointed to heal the sick. The Bible said that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost who went about doing good. And healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And the Bible said that as as God sent Jesus, so he has sent us to go and cast out devils. He said in my name you shall lay your hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. I came to announce to you tonight in Fitchburg that the spirit of the Lord is upon me to break hold every grip of the devil that has hold you bound the spirit of the Lord is upon me to break every chains of sickness every chains of disease that is afflicting your life tonight in the name of Jesus there has to be an announcement the devil knows it but you also must know it the devil knows my name And the devil knows that I do not come in my own name. But I come in the name of the son of the living God. I come in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So you see. The crusade videos you watch and all the testimonies. When we go there. There is one mindset we have. We go there and we tell the people we came here tonight to help you. We came here tonight to set you free. We came here tonight to deliver you. We came here tonight that you don't have to become a victim to the tricks of the enemy anymore. And I'm announcing to you in Fitchburg tonight, it doesn't matter what the devil has been doing against your life, tonight brings an end to all affliction of hell concerning your life. If you believe it, shout, I receive it. So, God anoints, puts his anointing on people so that they can manifest his name. They can prove his word. They can bring his word to pass in the lives of those that hear it. There's an anointing that comes upon individuals. There's an anointing that comes upon ministers to do what, to carry out what God has ordained them to do. We were in 
Huntington, Texas, not too long ago. And I'm showing you these videos for you to see what I'm talking about. Matter of fact, last night there was a man here who had two lumps in his breast, scheduled for a mammogram in December. You know what that is? When you have lumps in your breast, that is painful. That is very deadly to the people that don't know it. Let me tell you this. You know what I realized not too long ago? Not too long ago, I was scheduled to travel to Africa. And I developed a severe backache so bad. I could barely walk. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sit. I couldn't do anything. You could ask my wife. It was terrible. My wife stayed away from me because of how painful I, it was. Because, you know, when somebody's in pain and you can't do anything about it, it's like you are better off just... Because, you know, whatever you do, oh, it's okay. It, it even makes things worse. And then she tried to keep the kids away because the kids would jump on me and everything. I tried everything. It didn't go away. I went to the chiropractor and it made it worse. I took painkillers and it was, there, was, there was no painkiller strong enough to get rid of the pain. So then I realized that, let me practice what I preach. <laughs> So I went to God, and I went to God, and the day, on, that was on Wednesday, I stood in my room and prayed. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, and the longer I prayed, the more the pain went away. You know what that taught me? At that very moment, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I could take the pain away from you, I would have given them everything I could possibly give them for them to take the pain away. Can you, let's, let my friend, um, our prophet Benjamin, came all the way from Belgium to be with us. Can, can we give, them a, give him a seat? So, I realize that there is nothing called small pain. If you've never had a headache before, then you wouldn't think being delivered, being healed of headache is a miracle. When I had that back pain, I was like, I, I pray special, spe a special prayer for people that have back pains. If you've never had migraine before, when you see somebody being healed of migraine, you might think there's nothing to it. I met a man that had been suffering from running nose for many years. If you've never experienced that, and somebody gives a testimony that God healed me of running nose, you might think nothing of it. So, since I started doing this, I've realized that there's nothing called a small miracle. There's nothing called a small tes testimony. Have you ever had a splinter in your, in, your, in your pinky nail, in your nails? It's very uncomfortable. But the moment it goes away, there is a sign of relief. But you realize that God also does not heal according to the severity of your pain. God heals according to the faith. So, for a minister to minister healing, there has to be a proclamation. The people must know what this minister carries. Jesus said, for the spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he has anointed me. Listen, I am standing here with an anointing to break the back of sickness from you for good in the name of Jesus Christ. For the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Peter says, silver and gold have I not. Peter needed to proclaim to the sick man that, listen, you have met men. You have met people that have given you money. But we are not just ordinary men. There is something that we have in our possession that is able to change your story for good. You see, in a, in, when you begin to talk like this, you know, in, in, in our culture, in the Western culture, people might say that is prideful. No, but that must, those proclamations must go forth for those that hear it to know so that they can connect their faith. Because I preached a message a while ago. There's three steps to receiving from God. There must be faith in God, in the character, in the integrity, and in the, in the personality, who he said he is. There must be faith in his word. That his word is what it said it is. And there must be faith in the messenger, the one that carries the word. 
that this person is coming from God. Because if you are carrying the word of God, that which means that God has sent you, that which means that God has empowered you to bring forth what he had promised in his word to bring forth. So I know we have a culture where there is almost let no, no honor, a culture of, you know, I don't want to say dishonor, but no honor. Because what if you can't put a value on the gift that God has placed in a man, you can't put a value on the man. If you can't put a value on the man, then you, you, will not, you are not capable of receiving from that gift. Jesus, when, when um, Samuel said, Lord, they have rejected me because Israel were, asking, were now asking for a king. And Samuel said, Lord, they have rejected me. And God said to Samuel, they have not rejected you. They have rejected me. Because you, you have not been, you didn't go in your name. I called you, I ordained you, I positioned you there to lead my people. So if they no longer have no, have you, they no longer have use for you, that means they don't have use for me. So Jesus proclaimed, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because Jesus must announce to the people what he has, what he was on earth to do. People must understand that he, this is not, just my body you slap on your shoulder. This is a man that has the ability to change your destiny for good. This is a man that has the ability to change your story for good. Amen. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Peter says, silver and gold have I none. But what I have is far greater than what you think you need. <laughs> Let me tell you this. The anointing of God would bring to, to your life what is far greater than what you think you need. So there must be an anoint, there must be a proclamation, an announcement of the anointing, an announcement of the presence of God, an announcement that there is a grace here that is able to heal you of all manner and all kinds of diseases. We were in Huntington, Texas with my wife not a few years ago. I think this is probably 2020 during COVID. And when we were in that church, and you know, where I ministered and I prayed for the sick. And there was one particular old man, not old, let me not say old because people, he might not like that idea. <laughs> there was one particular young man. <laughs> I laid hands on him, he went under the power and he got up. And the next day this man came to church and he said, I have something to tell you. And I want him to finish the story from Huntington, Texas. I had uh, an affibrillation condition in my heart, which means that the upper part of my heart was going about a thousand miles an hour and the lower part of my heart was going about one. This resulted in uneven blood flow, starvation of blood to the brain, as well as oxygen deprivation to the body. The word was presented the other night And God, in his grace and glory, had signs follow. And the evangelist prayed for me. After I got up off the floor, yes, the slain in the spirit is a real thing. After I got up off the floor, I began to feel different. Later that evening, I felt a warm surge of blood through my carotid artery up into my brain and my brain which had been suffering oxygen deprivation for a while suddenly became very clear it was like a fog was lifted and I look around and I go wow this world really sucks (laughs) but isn't God good (laughs) so Then a little bit later, I realized I just walked up a hill and I'm not gasping for air. And you see, I used to sleep 12 to 14 hours every day because I didn't have enough energy to go through the day. Yesterday, I got up at six o'clock in the morning, which is shockingly early for me. And then I lasted all day long until last night, close to midnight after the services here 
and I never had to take a nap. I never had to slow down. I just kept going. God's amazing. So there has to be an understanding, there has to be an announcement made that the Spirit of the Lord is here. Jesus Christ, listen to me, the anointed man is not the one that heals. God is the one that heals. The anointed man is the channel through which God performs his healings. I've never healed a fly before. <laughs> Somebody brought me a, a mosquito with a broken leg. I tried. I prayed, I prayed, did all the gymnastics, and nothing happened. So I've never healed anything before. But I've seen God heal so many people through our, our ministry. One of the most striking testimonies that I've heard, in, in not, not striking, just the way it came, because... By the grace of God, we've seen this multiple times. But I was preaching in a, in a town called Embridge, Pennsylvania. And I was moving around like how I do here. And I saw an older woman. She's an older lady. This one, she's old, promise me. She was in her 80s, probably like 84, between 84 and 89. And like I move around, because I'm an evangelist and I move. So I moved around, I saw this lady. And I felt pulled towards her. But I didn't know, because I'm not a prophet, you see, this man will look at you and mention your name, your address, where you live, when you were born. I'm not like that. <laughs> I'm telling you, he, he would tell you what you ate today, what you ate yesterday. <laughs> He's a prophet, I'm not. So I moved towards the lady, and I said, at that time, my wife had just had a baby, so she wasn't in the service with us. I said, you're a very beautiful woman. If I wasn't married, I would have asked for your number. Just joking, you know, she was like an 89-year-old lady. But God has mysterious ways of, you know, ministering to people. And she said, oh, that's so nice. That so touched my heart. And I moved away, and you could tell she blushed. <laughs> you know, like it really touched her. It wasn't, I was joking, but to her it wasn't a joke. It was a very high compliment. So I went back. I said, what do you want the Lord to do for you? She said, well, I have arthritis all over my body. And I had, what is it, um, the shingles. I had shingles when I was a teenager. So because of that, I lost hearing in both ears. I said, a sign that God is going to heal the arthritis is that the ears are going to come open right now. I laid hands on this precious lady that I was trying to hit on. <laughs> and I prayed for her. And she said, oh, I can hear. My hearing is clear. Both ears came open instantly. You know, we finished the service. We went away. About a month or two months later, I opened the mail. And there was a letter in the mail. And this, this letter had about, I think, $40 or $50 note in there. And a long written letter. And this woman said, that what you said to me so touched my heart. Thank you. He said, for about 40 years of my marriage, my husband abused me. She made me feel so worthless. So what you said to me was so kind. You see, I thought I was joking, but that was a prophetic word from the Lord. She said that it touched my heart so much. And he said, guess what? In the letter, guess what? My ears are still open and the arthritis is completely gone. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring deliverance to those that have been oppressed by the devil for so long. Amen. Amen. And I, I'm, now I'm going to share more testimonies here. But there must be a proclamation that of the anointing. The anointing must be announced to help people's faith to receive. For you to receive a miracle, you must understand that it is God's will for you to be healed. In Matthew chapter 8, I believe verse number 2, the Bible says that a leper came to Jesus. And he says, the master, if it be thy will, make me whole. And Jesus said, you know what? I only heal people with flu. 
Miracles are not for today. Sometimes I heal. Sometimes God says yes. Sometimes God says no. And sometimes God says wait. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am willing. So for you to receive healing, there must be the revelation that it is the will of God for you to be healed. The Bible said that it is the thief that is the thief that steals and kills and destroys. Jesus said that I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It is the will of God for you to live in abundance of life. It is the will of God. He said, I wish above all things that ye may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. The Bible said that Jesus took stripes on his back that you might be healed. Hallelujah. You see, through our scriptures, there was not one person that went to Jesus for healing. And Jesus said, you should have come yesterday. Today we are closed shop. Today we are busy. Today we can't help you. The Bible says that every God anointed, how God so anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, who went about doing good and healing all. Everywhere Jesus went, the Bible said that he healed all. They brought the sick unto him and he healed all. They brought the lame unto him and he healed all. They brought the deaf unto him and the deaf began to hear. And the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8, that Jesus Christ, he is the same yesterday. He is the same today and he is the same forever. In Malachi, he says that I am the Lord God and I change it not. See, men may change their ways. Man may change their theology. Man may change their doctrines. But Jesus Christ never changes. He is the healer from the beginning. He is the healer from tonight. He was the one that healed in Ghana. He is the one that healed in Huntington. He is the one that healed in Jemison. He is the one that healed last night. And he would continue to heal in Jesus' name. You heard Pastor Brian talk about the man that had those things dissolved in his breast. Let's, let's play. Let's hear from him last night just right here. In the church. Let's hear from him. Tonight, I was, uh, I felt an urgency to get here. I had a hockey game and I rushed out the door uh, the moment I was done my game. And um, I was late to the message, but um, I heard quite a bit of the word. And then um, just hearing testimony after testimony, I felt like a rush to get to the front of the stage with... Um, for prayer and um he actually didn't even lay hands on me right away but i i just um just started operating in faith and um he asked us to you know test yourself and see if you've been healed and um i had two lumps in either one of my breasts they were super painful and the first thing that he said was your breasts and as far as healing and it was like that's for me that's my healing um i'm up here thank god and I just like went down on my knees. I kept checking my breast and the lumps went away. The pain was gone. And I just, it was like a, not like a, it was almost instantaneous, I would say. Um, but I was getting healed before the lumps were going down. But the, the pain is gone completely. The lumps are gone. No pain. So <laughs> uh, I have a mammogram set up for December. I can cancel that. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. What he has done for one, he can do for all. Amen. What God has done for one, he can do for all. So Jesus Christ, the one that healed the man, it wasn't the devil that healed the man last night. You know, if you don't know how severe this is, that is, when you have nerves or um, tumors in your breast and it's painful, it's most likely going to be cancer. And the Jesus that took away cancer from the breast. You know, we can show the pictures from Finland. Let me show you the pictures from Finland. I told you this on Sunday. There was a lady that came into our meetings. Because our, our ministry is audiovisual. We say it and we show you. We prove it to you. You understand what I'm saying? So we show it and we prove it to you. A lady came to our meeting. I showed the pictures on Sunday. I'm going to show it again. Stage 4 stomach cancer. Checked out of hospice. You know, when you go to hospice, what the doctors are telling you is that we have given up hope. There is nothing we can do. Just go, let's pump you up with morphines and die comfortably. That's what they're saying. You've been sentenced to death. And this lady came, the picture on the top was November 2018. 
November 2018. You see, because of chemo hair, she's lost hair. And this is January 2021. After the Lord, we laid hands on her. She went back to the hospital. They couldn't find any trace of cancer. They... And you see, that, that, is not, that is not just the testimony. That is, the testimony doesn't end there. The doctor said, yes, you've been healed of cancer, but we did the surgery. We took out your big intestines. So there's no way you could process food. You can't eat solid food. The lady looked at the doctor and said, Jesus doesn't do half work. According to her, she said that the doctors will call all, every time to check if she was still alive because she was eating anything that she could eat. She kept eating and she's been eating and then she sent us this um, January 2021 just for us to know that a miracle is still there, that she's alive, that whatever prediction the doctor gave them, whatever death sentence the doctor gave them, did not come to pass because the Bible says that upon whose report shall we believe and we declare that we shall believe the report of the Lord. I prophesy over your life tonight, everyone that has received a bad report from the doctors in the name that is above every other name, we cancel it in Jesus name and I declare that you shall not die but you will live to declare the works of the, of the Lord. You shall be a testimony that testifies of the goodness of God in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe you clap your hands and shout amen unto the Lord. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. The same Jesus that did it. This same Jesus. It is the will of God to heal the sick. It is the will of God to deliver you from the oppressions of life. It doesn't matter how bad your situation is. You are one prayer away from seeing the hand of God that lifts the beggar out of the dunghill hill and sets their feet upon the rock to stay. I prophesy over your life tonight in the name of Jesus that every bad situation is being turned around for he turned it in our favor. He is turning it for your good in Jesus' name. I see a divine turnaround coming your way in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You must believe there must be an announcement of the anointing. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. You must believe that it is God's will for you to be healed. See, the devil came to steal. The devil came to kill. The devil came to destroy. Anything that comes to steal from you, what does he steal? He steals your joy. He steals your time with your family. He steals your liberty, your freedom. Because sickness, matter of fact, is an imprisonment. It's like you have been confined to certain things where you can no longer do the things your heart desires to do. The Bible said that in the presence of the Lord there is fullness of joy and at his right hand there is pleasures. So it is the desire of God for you to have pleasures. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the devil put sickness on you so that you can no longer have the liberty for whom the sun set free is free. Indeed. You can't be free. You can't take your, your grandchildren out. You know, like that man, he has to sleep 12 to 14 hours a day because he had no energy to do anything. Wicked devil. The testimony I played yesterday from Huntington, Texas. The man had COVID and his heart, his lungs became deflected and his heart became what? Weak. Or whatever it was. And just one touch from God. The Lord turned everything around. See, that is what the devil wants to do. It is the will of the devil to get you sick. So that you begin to wonder if there is a God. There is many people that are so sick. They've, they've lost. They've looked at their life. Their life just supports everything. The scripture said their life is a contradiction of the Bible. Everything they believe. And they've given up on God. That's what the devil wants you to do. We, let me tell you this, the devil is a bastard. The devil is wicked. The devil doesn't play fair. Hallelujah. I feel in my spirit, you see, I'm not a prophet. The prophet is here, so let me just, I feel in my spirit, there is a lady here with something wrong with your breast. And when you heard that testimony, faith came alive in you. If that is you, let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lift up your hands to heaven. As I lay hands on you, I command whatever the situation is to turn around. 
total healing, complete healing in the name of Jesus. Jesus heals you. Jesus makes you whole. You are healed. You are free. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let me pray for a man with chest, um, pain in your chest, especially on your right side. You are afraid it's a heart attack or maybe you've had heart attacks. If that is you, if you are here, let me pray for you. You have pain in your chest. Is there anybody here like that? All right, let me go on. So, the devil wants to destroy your life with sickness. The devil wants you, the, the, you see, the Bible says that we are made in the image of God. So what the devil wants to do, that the devil wants to taint the image of God in your life with sickness and disease. That's what he wants to do. Because God cannot be sick. So you should not be sick. So every time you are sick, you, are, you no longer reflect the image of God. So your life is contradiction. It's a contradiction to what the scripture says. So the devil wants to look at God and mock God and say, listen, you said you made this guy like you. How come he doesn't look anything like you? So Jesus, God sent Jesus and said, deal with this once and for all. So Jesus took stripes on his back and every stripe he took, he saw your cancer. Every stripe he took, he saw your, 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 um, your back problem. He saw your blind eyes. He saw your deaf ears. He saw the migraine. He saw the headache. Every blood that was shed was a price that was paid for you. So that through his stripes, you would receive your healing. Tonight I prophesy, you might have come in here sick, but you are living here rejoicing and declaring that see what the Lord has done hallelujah. hallelujah so there must be a, you must know that it is the will of God see God does not will to heal some and leave some he wills to heal all the Bible says that Jesus Christ went about doing good and healing all so tonight you might have walked in here sick but not some are going to be healed. All shall receive a miracle in Jesus' name. When there is faith in God's word, then we would do what God's word says. Yesterday I said that all God requires from the believer is for us to believe in his word. Because when you believe in God's word, you would act upon his word. You know, when you believe in God's word, when he says that do not sin, because you believe it, you will not sin. Amen. When he says that be ye holy, because you believe it, you will be holy. Amen. When you believe in God's word, you will become doer of his word. Because when you believe in God's word, it means that faith has come alive in you. And the Bible says that faith without works is dead. It's utterly useless. So how do you respond to God's word? Not just saying that I believe, but by what you do. So when you believe in God's word and God's word says you are healed, you begin to act like you are healed. I remember when I was in Bible school and, you know, some of my Bible school friends are here. Pinel is here. Josh is here. I went to Bible school with them. And there was a time on campus I developed a very, very severe pain in my feet. I don't know where it came from. But all of a sudden, I couldn't put pressure on my heel. And it was so painful, excruciating, that I asked a friend, hey, can you drive me to Walmart? I went to Walmart and I bought a walking stick. I was going to buy a walking stick. I picked up the walking stick and I began to put pressure on it and it felt good. Because now, I, the pressure that was going on my heel is not going on the stick. So it felt like a, a relief to be able to walk. But whilst I was walking to check out, I, 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 the scriptures begin to just play in my mind. And I realize that if I truly believe that the stick was going to give me a, a relief, then I would carry the stick for the rest of my life. But if I believe that Jesus was my healer, right. then I don't need a stick. Right. So right there at Walmart, I said, devil, 
You, you would have to kill me with this pain because I'm going to walk like I am healed. I'm going to talk like I am healed. I'm not going to nurse this problem. I'm not going to pay attention because the word of the living God said that he took stripes that I might receive my healing. I receive what the sacrifice that Jesus did for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I put a stick down. Let me tell you, the pain didn't go away right away. It took about maybe days or weeks. But I remember I was in March. I was in New York. I went to a service in New York. And, you know, I never told anybody that I was in pain. I just walked funny. Nobody cared to ask me. So I just walked like this. <laughs> and we would, were walking in the Bronx. You know, the services, two services, one in the morning and then at night. So in between, we went to get food and everybody's going. It's cold in March and I'm walking like this. And I stopped and I said, ah, I'm not going to deal with this anymore. I'm done. Jesus did not die for me to walk, to tiptoe on the streets of New York. So I said to myself, I'm going to put pressure on this. I'm going to walk no more. And man, the first time I did it, it was so painful. But I started walking. I started walking. In the pain, I was catching up to them. They didn't know what I was going through, but it felt like my heart was about it because it was so painful. By evening time, we went to service. Everybody's jumping and shouting. I saw myself jumping and shouting, and it dawned on me. No, you can't do that. You are in pain. And I said, oh, where is the pain? I began to look for the pain. I began to look for the pain, and the pain had disappeared because I put a demand. I accepted the demands of the word. So now the Bible healed me. The word of God healed me. See, when you believe God's word, you will begin to act out the word. You know, we say we believe God's word, but our actions shows otherwise. Whatever we do is contrary to what we profess. You know, you, you have people come to church and then the, the man of God lays hands on them, prays for them, and declares you are healed. And you hear them have conversation in the in the, in the hallway and whatever they say undo everything that was declared over their life because what we say we believe is contrary to the way we act you must declare the anointing the spirit of the Lord is upon me you must know that it is God's will for you to be healed and you must act out what you believe you know, within a moment, a few moments, I'm going to pray for you. When I pray for you, you must act out what you believe. And then when you act out, after you've acted out what you believe, you must testify of what God has done for you. You know, in our ministry, because of the healing ministry, we go to different places and sometimes two years later you hear testimonies and you wonder, it, it would have encouraged me if you had told me earlier but it's not about me. Testimony puts, giving out your testimony gives glory to God and it puts a seal, a, it's like a, you've sealed the deal for your miracle. The Bible says that Jesus healed 10 lepers and out of the 10 lepers that Jesus healed, one came back to testify. But you see the difference between the one and the nine. Jesus healed them. If you know anything about leprosy, I used to live near a leprosy hospital in Ghana. The leprosy eats your skin, it eats your bones, it eats your flesh. It's a flesh-eating disease. It's one of the most wicked diseases you would ever see. And the oldest. So he's been there for ages. You see, the, the fingers are all gone. The nose is gone. The cheeks is gone. It eats everything it touches. It's like you pour acid on something. It just begins to eat it. If you get leprosy on your fingers, before you know it, your fingers is gone. And if you, you, you don't get healed from it, it will just keep eating it away. So Jesus healed them. When you are healed of leprosy, the skin gets clear. The leprosy disease leaves your body, but your fingers are still gone. Your nose is still gone. So the nine were walking around healed of leprosy, but walking around with no fingers and with no nose and with no toes. They were healed, but they had no fingers. They were healed, but they had no nose. They were healed, but they, were, they had no toes. 
But the one that came to Jesus, Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. So what is being whole? When a person is, misses some parts of their body, we say that it's what? Deformity. Wholeness is a person that has everything. So you see, the fingers that were missing all of a sudden appeared. The nose that were gone all of a sudden appeared. Because of his thanksgiving and because of his testimony, Jesus restored him to, to wholeness. Many believers lose their miracle because they refuse to give glory. Let me tell you this. Your shyness is not in comparison to what the devil intends to do with you for not giving God his glory. When God does something to you, the Bible says that proclaim the wonders of God. God tells us, let us talk about the goodness of God. Let us proclaim what God is doing. Let the whole world know that we don't serve a dead God, but we serve a living God who is alive and lives forevermore. The world must know about our God. You know, that's why we record testimonies. Because when people say that well, all you guys do is, you know, it's a lie. He said, why don't you go ask that lady? Why don't you, why don't you go to, matter of fact, in Huntington, the man that had the problem. When I went there, the pastor told me there was actually another man who was diagnosed with stage three cancer or whatnot. And the Lord healed him in that service. They never told us. We never recorded testimony, so we don't have it. But after I went there, I went back there, the pastor told me who was completely healed. The world must see that we are, our God is alive. Yes. They must see that what we are talking about is not just words, but it's a manifestation of the spirit and power that we serve a living God. Yes. You must let the world know. We share testimony. The Bible says that for they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by their word, the word of their testimony. We share testimonies because everybody must know that our God is alive and our God lives forever. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. Jesus Christ is the same today. Jesus Christ is the same forever. What he did then, he is doing it today. We were in Tanzania. You could play that video. We were in Tanzania. And there was a young man who was in the crusade who had an open sore in his belly. And according to his testimony, he has done everything. Western medicine, traditional medicine, and the sore wouldn't go away. And he says that liquids will come out of the sore. And in that crusade, instantly the power of God came upon him and the sore closed up. If you have that video, you can play it. Let every tumor disappear. Let every growth disappear. Be healed in your bodies by the power of the Holy Ghost. I came with a very big problem. I, I had a hole on my stomach and uh, I was yeah. But after the prayers from the man of God, the hole has really closed and nothing is coming out from the hole. So there was a whole creative miracle where Saul gets healed completely. So our God is alive. Jesus Christ is the same. Where, whatever he did then, he's still doing it today. And he's still doing it tonight. Hallelujah. So there must be faith that you have. That God has done it before. God did it for them and God would do it for me. God would do it for me. You must possess that kind of faith. You must know. There must be an expectation. When there is faith, there is, an ex there, there is an expectation. When you know that God did it then, God did it for them, and God is also going to do it for you, then there, there should be an expectation. The Bible says that for faith comes. The Bible says, one, we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That's why I'm sharing testimonies with you tonight. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why I'm preaching the word of God to you tonight. You must believe in the promises of God. You must believe that his promises are yes and they are amen. That whatever God has promised in his word, he is more than able, capable to bring it to pass. He can do exceedingly abundantly more than you can think or even imagine. God can do more than you can think or even imagine. 
So don't sell yourself short of God's ability. Oh, maybe he can do it for me. Maybe not. I don't know. There has to be that rugged expectation. The Bible said in Mark chapter 5 that the woman heard about Jesus. This lady heard about Jesus. The Bible says she has been bleeding for 12 and a half years, 12 years. She sold all her, she probably, had, probably was a rich woman, sold her livelihood and went after doctors. I talked about it yesterday. And the Bible said that she heard about Jesus. You see, what you hear, because the Bible said out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you hear will determine how you speak. What do you incline your ears to? In the book of Proverbs, he said, my children, incline your ears to thy hearing. Listen to my words. Listen to the words of faith. Let your heart be filled with the word of God. Let your heart be filled with the possibilities of the almighty God. Let your heart be filled with the will of God. Let your heart know that God can do exceedingly, abundantly more than you can think or even imagine. Let the word of God fill your heart. Let the word of God. The Bible says that let the word of God renew. Let your mind be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Let the word of God renew your mind. You need to connect your heart with God's word. You need to, you know, you need to marinate your spirit in God's word. Because faith comes alive when you get to the point of knowing. I said that somebody asked me, what is faith? I said faith is the knower in your knowing. When you know and you know. The Bible said, for Abraham was fully persuaded, Romans chapter 4. Abraham was fully persuaded that that which God has promised him was going to fully come to pass. So it didn't matter what was going around him. It didn't matter how progressing his age was become, how impossible his situation was becoming. He knew that he who has promised is more than able to bring it to pass. He knew that God is that is able to bring the dead back to life was more than able to make Sarah, whose womb was as good as dead, have a child. So, when you are fully persuaded, you lose the consciousness of time. You are no longer worried about how long the situation, you know, you know the end from the beginning. The doctor said you have, like the lady from Finland, the doctor said you have a few months to live. She said, no, 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 no. That is not my story. That might be the case for somebody else, but that is not my case. That might be the case for somebody else, but that is not my case. At some point, you should look at, they say that, oh, the economy is going bad. They're about to lay people off. And you, you look at them and say, that might be the case of somebody else, but that is not my case. They can tell you that, listen, there is a new disease coming and it's going to kill so many people. That might be the case for somebody else, but that is not my case. For the Bible said that with long life, would he satisfy me? Hallelujah. You know, my cousin called me one time and he said, can you pray for me? I said, yes, I could pray for you. You know, family people are the last people to receive that there is a gift on your life. So when family comes and say, can you pray for me? I, I take it serious. You know, there's a family, there was a relative in Ghana who had been suffering from miscarriages. They get pregnant and they lose the baby. They get pregnant and they lose the baby. They get pregnant, they lose the baby. And I'm the man of God in the family. She hasn't asked me to pray, so I don't pray. Yeah. Then one time I was in Ghana. She came to me and said, can you pray for me? That it was in June, two years ago. And I laid hands on her. And I said, a year by this time, you shall carry your baby. Guess when she delivered? June the following year. If she had known better, she would have only suffered one miscarriage if she had come quicker. <laughs> she would have only suffered one miscarriage. When she suffered that miscarriage, she should have come and would have prayed. But family members are funny. I remember my sister, she moved out of here to um, Pennsylvania. She used to go to church here. She loved it here. But I convinced her to come closer because I was tired of traveling to see my niece and nephew. So she was talking to my mom. And she was going to a hospital appointment for her hearing because she realized that she was going deaf. She couldn't, she was having hardness of hearing, so she was going for a hearing test. And my mom was like, have you asked your brother? I was talking to her, actually, I was on the phone with her when my mom called. So she was like, I'm going for a hearing test. I was like, oh, okay. 
Oh, we thank God, you know. They didn't offer to pray for you. I'm not going to waste my prayer. Because you can't waste prayer on people that don't receive from you. That's why I say you must believe that there is an anointing. So she said, oh, mom is ringing in. I got off the phone and mom, my mom got on the phone. And apparently, my mom asked her where she going. said, I have a problem with my hearing and I'm on my way for a test. And my mom asked her, smart woman, have you had your brother pray for you? So I, she didn't tell me that my mom said that. But she called me and said, while she was at the hospital, like getting ready to go walk into the door, she called me and said, can you pray for my hearing? I said, I was waiting for you to ask. I prayed for her, and immediately everything, the cloudiness, the ringing stopped, everything cleared. Amen. She went in, and the test was fine. And then, so I didn't know that she never told me this. So a few days later, you know, every family, you have one guy, one sibling. That is like the trouble one. So my, our last born, he is like <laughs> the guy that, if you are talking, he's listening, and he goes to tell this person. <laughs> so he called me. He said, did your sister call you? I said, I talk to her every day. She said, did, he, she, did she ask you to pray for her? I said, yes. He said, oh, she was talking to mommy. And mommy said, why don't you ask your brother to pray for you for your years? I was like, oh, so that's where it came from. <laughs> so my cousin called me and said, they are laying people off at my job. She has a very lucrative job. They are laying people off at my job. Can you pray for me? I said, I don't need to pray for you. You are a tither, you are a giver, you have covenant, you are a child of God, you are exempted. Yeah. You know, they laid so many people off that, I think it was during COVID, they laid so many people off, you know what happened to her? She got a promotion. Amen. And she got a pay raise. You are exempted. Amen. I, was, I was going through the airport, I was traveling, going if you've been to Pittsburgh Airport, I was in the tram going to my gate. And one of my friend's brother, whom I know, I, I, I got his phone number but never called him. All of a sudden, I started thinking of him heavily. And I, I, I don't know, he's not my friend. His brother is my friend. But I started thinking of him. So I took my phone. I said, hey, bro, is everything okay? I said, bro, how are you? He said, I'm good. Is everything okay? He said, yes, everything is okay. And then I was like, okay. And then within a few minutes later, he tested me. He said, actually, no. I said, what is the problem? He said, there is this lady at my work who is making it hard for me at work. I said, okay, that's, that's, that's not a big deal. You're a Christian. Your grandfather was a missionary. Your father was a missionary. All your family are Christian. You've been serving the Lord. There is no way an unbeliever is going to make it hard for you at work. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I remove her from it. But I'm telling the true story. This is a true story. I'm not making up stuff. Right, right, right. I said, in the name of Jesus, I remove her from her post. He went into the office the next, I think the next week, because he traveled for work, the next week, and there was a transfer letter for that lady. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. This is true. I could call him on the phone right now. There must be faith in God. You must believe the word of God, what the word of God says concerning your life. You know, let me tell you one, another testimony that we, pray, we were preaching in a, in a town in, in the northern Ghana. And during the pastor's conference, one pastor asked me, he said, what do you do when you've been plan, trying to plant a church in a village? But there is this very powerful witch doctor in that village. And every time you try to plant the church, he threatens the people because, you know, small villages. Threatens the people not to come to church. And because he's so powerful, they're all afraid. You gather the people, and within a matter of months, they scatter. Nobody comes to church anymore. I said, then pray him out. He said, you don't understand, man of God. We've been praying. I said, oh, you've been praying, but I haven't prayed. <laughs> you've been praying, but I haven't prayed. Come on. I called him forward. I grabbed his head. I said, I, said, I, re I relocate this witch doctor. Within two months, the man packed his bags and left. They asked him, where are you going? He said, I don't know. This is a true story. These are testimonies that we've recorded. I could tell you testimonies like that. Back to back, back to back, back to back. You know, when I first encountered um, Prophet um, Benjamin, he called me and we were just talking. You know, he's a prophet. You're just talking. He said, man of God, you know, sometimes when you are preaching and you make bold declarations and you call witches to come. 
I said, oh, I was in Tanzania. I called witches to come and witches came. <laughs> he didn't even know that. Because when you have faith in God's word, you know that your life is secured regardless of what is around you. Amen. You see, the thing that the devil is afraid of, the devil tries so hard to disconnect you with the voice of God. Because the devil tries to disconnect you from the, hearing the voice of God and knowing the word of God. Because when you know the word of God, there is nothing the devil can do to stop you from becoming who God wants you to become. When you know the word of God, there is nothing the devil can do to stop you from receiving your miracle and receiving your healing. So the devil tries everything to disconnect you. Jesus talked about the seed. He says that a, a, a sower sows the seed. And what happened? Some fell on good soils. Some fell among thorns. Some fell on, on, on rocky grounds. And he says that the ones that fell among thorns and the, and the pathways and the rocky grounds was the devil coming to take the seed after the seed had been sown. So you see, the devil's work is to destroy the seed from germinating on the good soil of, of your heart. Because the moment the seed gets in contact with the good soil, it can do nothing but to produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. So when the word of God comes in contact with your heart, and it gets a good place to settle. It can do nothing. Jesus said, the word of God said that the word that I've spoken can now return to me void. But it would accomplish. Let me tell you, when the word of God concerning your divine health comes forward, it can do nothing but accomplish divine healing in your body. When the word of God of prosperity comes in your life, it can do nothing but bring prosperity in your life. So the devil does everything to disconnect you from God's word. But you have sat here too long. You have listened too many words. And whatever the devil, whether the devil likes it or not, the word of God shall produce in your life. Whatever the devil likes it or not, you shall receive your miracle in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You know, in this church, there is something that I'm very, very hesitant to pray about because you guys already have it. Almost everywhere we've went, you guys, my wife, there's many people we've met. Matter of fact, I met one guy last week, both of his kids, we prayed for him, both of the kids. One time he walked into my office with his wife crying. He said, can you pray for us? We've been trying to have a baby. Every time my wife gets pregnant, she loses the baby. Laid hands on him, prayed, had a, they had a child. We traveled to their church. The father has a huge church, huge, huge church. Traveled to the church. He said, oh, thank God you are here. We, we want to have another kid. It was last year. Last year, we won't have another kid. I'm like the kid producing machine. <laughs> I laid hands on, 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 on them again. I saw them this year with their two weeks year old baby. Amen. There was a guy from Canada. He's my friend. This is this testimony, like even when I talk about it, I still get chills. I was doing a broadcast online. And all of a sudden in the morning, I was doing morning prayer. All of a sudden... This guy, I couldn't shake him off my mind. I couldn't shake him off my mind. And whilst I was ministering, I saw him comment. He put his name there. So I, I, I spoke. I said, I declare in the name of Jesus that a year by this time, a baby shall suck the breast of your wife. I didn't know what they were going through. I know they were just newly married. And God of the broadcast got a phone call. This guy is crying. He says that, listen, we've been going in and out of the hospital. My wife was born with a deformity in her ovaries or whatever, you know, the women have in there. She was born with a problem there. The doctor said that she can never have conceived. And even if she conceives, we must abort it immediately because her womb cannot hold a child or else she will die. The guy told me that. I said, ah, if I knew this story, I would never prophesy. I would have never told you what I told you. <laughs> but thank God I didn't know. So he told me that. I said... The Lord, the word of the Lord said, a year by this time, a baby shall suck the breast of your wife. And when I got off the phone, I was like, I should probably encourage them to go adopt a newborn baby. Because now I'm scared. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, not only they said, yet if she gets pregnant, she will die. So if she, he stands by my prophetic word and dies, what am I going to do? You killed my wife. 
<laughs> I would never be able to travel to Canada again. I'm going to Canada in two weeks. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm going to Canada in two weeks. So he told me that, but then I repeated, the word of the Lord said a year by this time, a baby shall suck the breast of your wife. And then I got off the phone, I was like, maybe they should do adoption. And then I said, I said to myself, if it goes bad, I would say a baby shall suck the breast of your wife. I didn't say your wife will get pregnant. <laughs> so you can't use that against me. I went back on Facebook to replay what I said. <laughs> because, you know, you are a prophet. You know, sometimes the spirit of God comes upon you. You know God is speaking, but when you get to your flesh, he shocks you. <laughs> <laughs> it shocked me. I was, yeah. So then, 2020, in December, on my way to Ghana, December 6, 2020, I remember, at JFK, I got a phone call. Hello, bro. You are the first person that I'm going to tell you this. So, okay. We just found out that my wife is pregnant. Just to encourage myself, I said, the word of the Lord said, a year by this time, a baby shall suck from the breast of your wife. And then I'm like thinking what he told me. And then one problem after the other. He called me and the doctor said, we, they have to take out the baby. I said, the word of the Lord said, a year by this time, a baby shall suck from the breast of your wife. He called me again. They said that the baby is not growing in the womb. If the baby doesn't grow to a certain point, we'd have to take out the baby. I said, the word of the Lord said, a year by this time, the, a, a baby shall suck the breast of your wife. Yeah. And then one issue after, I, I got tired. I didn't want to pick up his phone calls anymore. But then one day I was driving to buy a gun. I was driving to Shores, buy a gun. And the word of the Lord came upon me again. I picked up the phone, I called, I said, Michael, don't worry. I mentioned him. It's fine. It's a testimony. He shares it everywhere, so it's fine. When he saw me in, um, in July, he gave me a hug and started crying. He said, you, don't, you can't believe what God used you to do for me. I said, Michael, don't worry. Whatever is going on, everything is going to be fine. The baby will be fine and your wife will be fine. Amen. Little did I know that they were in the hospital. It was, they said that the, um, the cord, the umbilical cord was wrapped around the baby's neck. And they had to do an emergency C-session to get the baby out. And I'm telling you, the baby was healthy. The wife is healthy. The baby is healthy today. Everything is completely fine. We were in a church in Houston. We were in a church in Houston. And the, I don't want to give too much details, but there was a young man and a, and a wife there, young couples that have been believing God to have a child. They came to me in the service. I lay hands on them. They just dedicated, the baby actually was, last Sunday was the first day they brought the baby to church because they just had a baby. So, faith in God's word can do what the word said it would do. What God requires from his children is only belief. The Bible said that to them that believe all things are possible. All things are possible. See, the Bible didn't say that some things are possible. He says that all things are possible. It is possible for the barren womb to carry a child. It is possible for a dying business. Matter of fact, talking about a dying business, there is a man I, I, you know, that has been a very great help to, our, to my, my life and our ministry. This man, when I met him for the first time, he was in a service like this. I was leading prayer meeting at noon. Doing prayer and fasting, he was sitting in the back. And this man was skinny. His wife sitting next to him. And they were just sobbing, sobbing, sobbing. You know, I'm a tough guy. I don't like weak men. You know, it's just something. I know they want to sissify this generation. But I, I don't like that. I like men to be men and women to be women. And I'm not saying that it's, it's not, it's not, um, I'm not saying it's wrong for men to cry. But I came from a place where if a man cries, they will give you a more reason to cry. <laughs> you know. so it's just me it's just when your mom sees you crying she'll give you a more reason to cry an actually legit reason to cry so I saw him sobbing in the back so and at the end of the service he wanted to talk to me and I tried to avoid him because he looked sad nobody likes depressed people 
He looks sad and depressed, and I'm trying to get my spirit up. High spirit. <laughs> trying to get my spirit up. But then he caught me. He's like, I passed here, and he passed there, and he said, can I talk to you? I said, okay, we met at a juice bar. This man began to tell me, he said, I had 12 employees. Now all that I have left with is me and my wife. My business is going under. I'm losing my home. I'm losing everything. And I understood why he was sitting in the back crying. He flew all the way from Florida to come to the prayer meeting. Park life, is that you? <laughs> it's like I'm seeing familiar faces. People are like, I know. <laughs> so, he was sat there. I grabbed his hand, both him and his wife's hand. And I prayed. I'm telling you, if I prayed, I prayed. I prayed with everything that is within because I was so upset. I was upset at what the devil was doing to that man and the family. They were losing their home. They were going to be homeless. A businessman who had made so much money and all of a sudden has nothing. I prayed. I prayed. So this man, AJ. Oh. <laughs> Chichi, AJ, look at him. He's old now. Look at his face. <laughs> That's my friend. That's, you know what? I'll go back to the story. But when I first got saved, I prayed to God. I said, God, I want Christian friends because I had none. And the first Christian friend I had was him. And let me tell you, we stayed together. We were in the same room. We literally, like, he moved into my house. And we prayed, we prayed, we prayed. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost whilst I was praying with him. And I was a Presbyterian, so I didn't know what it was. So the tongues would start coming out, and I would suppress it because I thought I was going crazy. Later on, I found out that I was... <laughs> So that's, that's, my, that's my brother. I want you to give him a clap for him. So this man, after I prayed for him. And then I didn't hear from him again. And one day it dawned on me. I was like, where is this guy? I was like, oh, maybe he lost his home. He's homeless somewhere. I'm not even going to contact him. And then he's like, can you send me $500? And I don't even have $500 to send him. So you know what? Let, just let it be. At least I tried. I did what I know how to do, which is to pray. And God is the one that answers. Just left it like that. So then I went to open my mail. And there was two American Express gift cards for $500 each. And it was from this guy. So I got his phone number. I was like, wait, he's, if he's homeless, how can he send me an American Express gift card? So I called him. I said, hey, brother, how is everything? He said, oh, you don't know? He said, everything turned around. Everything is good. Yeah. Not only did he get his home back now in that same area, within a year, he had two houses there. Amen. Paid off the house that he was about to lose. Let me tell you, if I tell you that that guy is doing well, he is doing well. He's a millionaire now. Amen. He is a millionaire now. He has like multiple businesses. Doing well. It's beyond, I'm telling you, it's like, I can't express to you how well he's doing. And I, he's been such a huge blessing. I spoke with him today because of the hurricane in Florida, so I just wanted to make sure he was good. And last year, he called me. He said, hey, do um, you want to go watch a Miami Heat game? I said, cool. Can I bring my son? That, Josiah was one or two? One. One. No, he was two because it was in November. He had just turned... Oh, he's, let me listen to my wife. <laughs> Just, my son was one. He bought us a ticket right behind, you know, the, the, where the reporters sit, Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. We sat there, I'm telling you, I was going there like a superstar. <laughs> I remember during the halftime break, I was just standing there. Shaq kept looking at me, Sha Shaquille O'Neal. He kept looking at me, kept looking at me. And then he walked towards me. Because, you know, I'm also a big deal, so I'm not going to go and be like, <laughs> can I get it? No, no, no. He walked up to me and shook my hand. Tell me he, his hand drowned my hands. <laughs> he is not a normal human being. I'm telling if you meet him in person, whatever you see online is, in person is worse. He is. You know when the Bible says that there were giants on the land? They... That we should change the scriptures. You say that there are giants on the land. <laughs> He's a huge man. A huge man. So I'm telling you this to say that God, faith in God can turn situations around. Amen. 
It doesn't matter how low you are. God can, the Bible says that he lifts the beggar out of the dunghill and sets their feet upon the rock to stay. It doesn't matter how hopeless your situation is. He gives hope to the hopeless. He is the father to the fatherless, husband to the widow. There is nothing that God cannot do for you. There is no, you know, to make things may seem impossible, but with God, all things are possible. We serve a God of possibilities. We serve a God of no limits. So don't limit God to your circumstance and say that, you know what, maybe this is just my situation, maybe this is my story. Maybe God can't do anything about my situation. You are one prayer away from seeing the hand of God completely flip your case. Where God turns your morning into dancing. Where, where doors have been shut to you, doors begin to open. And now all that you are wondering is which door I should enter into. There was a girl when I used to live in Worcester. There was a girl, she was 30 years old, believing, I'd be believing God for a husband. And I remember in her old years, 30 years on earth, no guy had ever shown interest in her. And she wasn't an ugly girl. She was a very beautiful woman, nice body, everything. You know, like any guy would desire. But no guy had ever shown interest. And we prayed with her. We prayed with her. We prayed with her. Within one day, two guys called and said, I don't know what was going on, but I like you. One guy called at 9. One guy called at 9. One guy called at 11 a.m. I don't know what was going on, but I like you. And she accepted the guy that called at 9 a.m. And I called her. I said, what if the guy that called at 11 a.m. had called at 9 a.m., 8 a.m.? What would you have said? He said, I would have gone with whoever came first. <laughs> so it seemed like all doors were shut against her. When God began to open the doors onto her, now she had the choice to choose who he wanted, who she wanted to be. That is going to be your story. That what seems have, that whatever has been hard for you would become easy for you in the name of Jesus. You see, when God favors you, when God turns, when God pays attention to you, because faith draws God's attention to you. Jesus was walking in the midst of the people and blind Bartimaeus began to scream, Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. And all of a sudden, Jesus stopped. The woman with the issue of blood began to crawl in the midst of the people. She touched the hem of Jesus' garment and all of a sudden, Jesus stopped. And Jesus said, Daughter, be of good cheer for thy faith has made thee whole. You see, when you actually listen to her story, in, the, in Leviticus, when a woman is on her period or bleeding, she was considered unclean. She was not allowed to go in the midst of people because whoever she touched becomes unclean. And if you are unclean and you purposefully make others unclean, you will be stoned to death. So what she did being there, she was risking her own life. But you know from scriptures I've seen throughout the Bible that any man that said, if I perish, I perish, never perished. Because faith would say that, you know what? Even if they slay me, I will still live. Faith will say that you can throw me in the, in the lion's den. The lion's mouth will be shut. You can throw me in the fire and the fire will not have the power to consume me. For yet there I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death. I shall fear no evil because the greater one lives on the inside of me. Greater is he who lives in me than they that are against me. I see the spirit of God coming upon you. I see the gift of faith coming alive in you. I see you running through the troops and leaping over the walls. There will be no sickness too hard to take you down. I see the life of God coming upon you in the name of Jesus Christ. Faith in God will turn every situation around. Will turn whatever is unfavorable. It will turn it in your favor. See, all that is what God is requiring from his children. Just believe. God wants you to believe him. God wants you to believe him for who he is. Believe him for his character. Believe him for the integrity of his word. Believe him that he's not a man who should lie. He's not a liar. 
That's why the Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. Because just imagine you telling somebody, I'm going to do something for you, and they begin to doubt you. You know, when I tell my wife something, and she like, asks me again, I don't respond. Because it feels like you don't trust me, you are doubting me. So just imagine me a mere human. So how much, how does God feel? God is pleased when you say that I know you are going to do this for me. Because you sacrifice your son, your only son, for my sake. If you would kill Jesus for me, then what are you now willing to give, do for, for my sake? That is faith. That you have to understand that which is, more, which is greater? To send Jesus to die for the salvation of the world or to give you a brand new disc? To open your eyes. To make you to walk out of here without pain, which is harder. If God did the hardest, then he is more than able to do for you the least. That's why, you must, that's why I have so much confidence in God to heal you. I have so much confidence in God to heal you. There was a lady from Boston. She's a lawyer. You know, I was praying for, I didn't even know this. I was praying online and I used to do this cool program called Morning Prayer, which I stopped, which I need to do it again. Because there are so many miracles and testimonies we recorded from that program. This lady wrote us a letter and had a thousand dollar check in it. And she told us her testimony. She said you were ministering online and you said that there is a lady watching. God is giving you a brand new cartilage. And I promise you this, I didn't know what a cartilage, cartilage was. I'm from Africa. I speak broken English. <laughs> so when I read that, I went on Google, what is a cartilage? That's when I... <laughs> You know, I graduated first class from Google University. <laughs> she said, you said there's a lady watching. God is giving you a brand new card. She said that the moment you said that, I felt warmth come over my knee and every pain disappeared. He said the cartilage in her knee had worn out. So her, her legs was bone scrubbing the bone. So she was in constant pain, constant on pain meds. She's a lawyer. So she wasn't fake. She's not one of those crazy charismatic people. Who, you know, everything. No, she was an educated Massachusetts woman. The hardest to impress. <laughs> the Lord healed her, gave her a testimony. There was another Massachusetts educated, I told you this story the other day. She was a doctor, I think doctor in education, not even a medical, doctor in education. Those who would be the hardest. Deaf in one ear, and the Lord opened her, her deaf ears. Don't tell me that God cannot do for you that which you are believing him to do for you. Whatever you think is big is small in the eyes of God. All God requires of you tonight is to have faith in him. Faith in the living God. Faith in God. Hallelujah. I don't want to preach long tonight. But I know there is people here that even as I'm speaking, your faith is coming alive. Because when you, be, when you start believing, you will start to act. Your faith would, would affect the decisions you make, would affect the actions you take. The woman heard about Jesus, she believed. Your faith will first affect your speech. When you believe, it affects what you say. And when you begin to speak, it will affect what you do. So you see, out of the abundance of the mouth, and of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when it is in your heart, the word of God is in your heart, the word of God will begin to come out of your mouth. And when the word of God comes out of your mouth, you will begin, your life will begin to align to the word of God. So, when you start believing, you will start to begin to do what you couldn't do before. You will start to do what the word of God says. We are preaching, and this is the last testimony I will share, and I pray for you. My wife and I were in Connecticut not too long ago. And after the service, we were walking out, and one young a lady brought her daughter. I think she was probably in her 20s. And said, can you pray for my daughter? 
And the moment I looked at a girl, I knew what was wrong with her. You asked me, how did you know? Was it the Lord that showed you? No. I knew what was wrong with her by her makeup. You know, when somebody is confused about what color makeup they want to do, and they put all the colors in their face, you can tell what is wrong with them. I remember I was in Pittsburgh. One guy from, flew from Texas with his girlfriend and brought his girl. He said, hey, man of God, this is my girl. I want to marry her. What do you think? I said, she's crazy. <laughs> how, do you, how do you know she's crazy? Did you see it in the spirit? No. How do you know? Because she couldn't decide what color she wanted to put on her face, so she put all the colors on her face. <laughs> so she's crazy. You can tell. Now everybody's checking their makeup to see. <laughs> I'm not talking about you. <laughs> so I saw the girl in Connecticut. I knew what was wrong with her. I diagnosed her. So I put my hand on the side of her head. I said, you foul spirit of insanity. I command you to come out of her. She went under the power, laid down for a little bit. We, we walked out of the service. We left. We came back the following year. The girl was sitting there. And you know how I knew she was healed? Because <laughs> of her makeup. <laughs> Am I lying? It's true. She wasn't now. She made up her mind and put one color makeup on her face. Everything was on point. You know, the, my... my my niece and nephew, they, they say like, some, they use some vocabularies that I feel like I'm, I'm older now, so I don't understand. But they would say something like, she was on fleek, is it right? <laughs> so I knew she was healed. I called her, I said, tell me what happened. The mom said that she has schizophrenia, she couldn't keep a job. And at that time when I was taking her testimony, she had two jobs. The power of God. The power of God that is able. You know, there was a, if, if I start sharing testimonies, we will not leave this place. I'm telling you. There is something about God that when you learn to believe and trust him, let me, the Bible says that for they that know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploit. The more you know God, the more the limitations break off from your life. The more you know God, the more you soar higher in life. So if there's anything I would admonish for you this week, is that desire to pursue after the knowledge of God. See, the Bible didn't say that for lack of prayer, my people, my people perish. The Bible said that for lack of knowledge, knowledge of God. I'm telling you, seek to grow your faith in God. That is, you know, because they can take everything you have from you, but they can't take what is in your mind and your heart from you. Amen. That is the truth. The knowledge of God would cause you to flourish wherever you are placed, wherever you are put. You would, there will be nothing, there will be no city too hard for you to take. There will be no town too hard for you to take. Amen. When you have God in your heart. Rise up on your feet. I want to ask you this question quickly before I pray for you. If you are here and you are saying that, preacher, I need to know God more. I feel like I had a relationship with God. But because of the cares of this world, because of the troubles of this world, I've allowed a separation to come between me and God. And now I look for God. I don't even know how, where to start or how to start. The Bible said that you must be born again. Maybe you were once born again, but you are not living for him. Or maybe you've never been born again. There must be a time in your life where you called on to God and said, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my personal Savior. Let tonight be that night. Let tonight be that night. Let me pray with you. Let's seal the deal. Let's say bye-bye to the devil for good. And let's turn to the living God. With every head by every eye closed. If that is you, I want you to lift up your right hand wherever you are standing. I'm going to pray for you. Let's say bye bye to the devil and let's turn to God for good tonight. 
If that is you, lift up your right hand and wave it at me. I see your hand. I see your hand. Who else? I see your hand. God is reaching out to you. God is saying, come. The Bible says that for he stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. And anyone that would let him in, he would come in, he would eat with you, and you would eat with him. God wants to have a relationship and fellowship with you. You have tried everything else. Try Jesus tonight. Try Jesus tonight. If you lifted up your hand, I want you to quickly join me in the front. The ones with the most boldness come first. And your boldness would help others to come. And if you did not lift up your hand, but you know you need to be here, I want you to quickly join me. Hallelujah. Clap for them as they come. Is there anyone else? Everyone that lifted up your hand, I want you, don't be shy. Listen, when it comes to this, this is the most important decision you'll make in your life, number one. And in this, it's not about who is standing on your left or your right. That is about your eternal destination. It's, about, it's between you and Jesus. It's between where you would spend eternity. So don't be shy. If you are standing there, God is having, tucking your heart. I know there are people, God, it's like all of a sudden your heart began to beat fast. God is reaching out to you. God is calling you. I want you to quickly join me in the front and let's pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is there anybody else? I'm giving you 30 seconds. The Bible says that today when you hear the call of salvation, do not harden your heart. God is reaching out to you. You know you need to be here. I want you to come before we finish praying. Lift up your hands to heaven. And I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. Praise the Lord. Join us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know there is more people. God is reaching out to you. Your heart is beating fast. You know it's like somebody poured cold water all of a sudden. It's like chills, goosebumps all over your body. It is the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart. Let me tell you this story, then we pray. A few years ago, I was in the office, and all of a sudden, I started having troubles in my belly. And I rarely use the restroom when I'm outside. If I am close to the house, no matter where I am, I will drive home to use the restroom, unless I absolutely have to. So the office was about five to ten minutes from, the, from my house. So it was in the midst of conversation. And I have a very bad habit. I can be disinterested within a matter of minutes. You can be talking to me and my mind is somewhere. And I would walk away and I would not even realize it. And my wife would tell me, coffee? Like, he's talking to you. I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> so it was one of those instances I was talking to. Patrick, Magalis, and myself were talking. I just walked away. I didn't, even, I didn't even think about it. Probably think this guy is crazy. Walked away, got into the car. And the moment I got to my house, there was somebody standing in front of the door knocking. I said, excuse me, can I help you? He said, are you a pastor? You know, at that time, I wasn't a pastor. I said, yeah, well, you know, because I'm not going to go into theological debate. But actually, there is fivefold ministry, you know, apostle, prophet. I said, yeah, I'm a pastor. He said, can you pray for me? I prayed for the lady, led her into, into the sinner's prayer, led her to the Lord. I went home, the pain went away. I sat down. And I began to think, maybe it was God. This lady, God brought me here for this lady. There was another knock. I went out. She said, can you pray the same prayers with my husband? I led the husband to the Lord and went home. I don't know. My wife said it was weeks, but I think it was days. We, were, we woke up one Saturday. I looked out of the window, and there was police all over the neighborhood. Forensic trucks. So my wife and I, you know, that time we didn't have kids, so we had a lot of times to gossip and try to figure things out. <laughs> My wife said, what do you think is going on? I said, that man looks suspicious. I think he probably killed somebody and they are investigating him. My wife was, do you think something happened to the, the wife? I said, no, 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 I think it's the man. I think he's probably buried a body somewhere. You know, just like, because we've been watching forensic files and <laughs> so <laughs> we're trying to figure it out. So whilst we were looking through the people, trying to figure out everything, there was a knock on the door. So, oh, shit, the police are going to come ask us, did you see anything? I'm going to tell them, I think he did it. <laughs> so the door opened. I opened the door, and the man was standing there. I said, oh, he's coming to the father to confess his sins. God cannot forgive you for this one. 
So he said, can I come in? Yes. He sat down with tears in his eyes. He said, I went out to play tennis. And when I got back home, I saw Sharon laying down dead. He said, all I want to ask you is that the prayer you prayed with her, do you think it works? I said, according to the Bible, yes. Because the Bible said that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you are saved. So I said, if the Bible is true, she is in heaven. You see, that was God's last attempt to save her soul. Because God knew that what the devil had planned, and God knew that she didn't have the power to resist the attack that was coming against her life. But God said, the Bible said that Jesus has delayed in his coming so that no one would perish. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would have eternal life. So that was God's last attempt to save her soul. And God did, and I believe, as I believe in the word of God, that she is in heaven. So you never know. That's why Jesus said that when you hear this call today, do not hack in your heart because no one knows tomorrow. No one knows tomorrow. So whilst I'm speaking there, you know that you need to turn your life around. God is reaching a calling you still. You know, I don't give prolonged uh, altar calls. There must be a reason why I'm sharing this testimony. If you are here and you know in your heart of hearts, that you need to make things right with God. You have allowed sin to separate you from God. On hid, hidden sin, things that nobody knows about. But let me tell you this, God knows. You act spiritual, you are a prayer warrior, but you have a side check somewhere. Everybody sees you to be sister who, brother who. But you know there is something that is separate. You can't go before God with boldness because of the sin. God is saying that tonight, bring it and lay it under the cross and let God wipe it away and throw it in the sea of forgetfulness and open up a new page for you. If that is you, I want you to join us whilst we pray. I want you to lift up your hands to heaven and pray this prayer with me from the bottom of your heart. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord. And you are my savior. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash me with your blood. I believe that I'm saved. God is my father. Heaven is my home. And I will never turn back. Amen. I want to welcome you to the family of God. You are saved as I am. Your sins will no longer be held against you. God gives you a brand new life. And from today, you shall live a successful Christian life all the days of your life in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can go back to your seats. I want you to lift up. Just give me a few moments. Let me minister to you. Just lift up your hands, F.A. Just lift up your hands. Let's begin to worship God. If you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you can begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. He touched me. Oh. And oh, watch on the floods my soul. Hey, man, those are local doshas. Something happened. And now, now I know he touched me. me.
Just lift up your hands to heaven. Praises to your name. Sing it from your heart. Sing it like you mean it. Sing it like you are bringing, you are singing praises to God. Just lift up your voice and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost all over this place. Kimantolo sheke tele bada da da bosha. Zeyandeli akato shele kada da bosha le de bosha. Zipa kapata la da bosha shele de de bosha. Zaka tele bosha. E kala da da bosha ke te te zele de de bosha. Ya panda zeke pandoso ke ple katalando sheke de de bosha. Apa pampa ya e kala da da bosha ke ple katalada bosha. Zependa le de de bosha zeke patalaba a zeke pandoso kotolo godosha. E kala ndo sheke ple le le bosha kala bosha ze plende le 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 bosha e katala da da bosha ze ke pandosha makado she le bosh e kala da 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 bosha father we thank you lord Shake it in the bush and it in the bush. Eh, Mahandala, say it to the bush. Zele Karabosh, it in the bush, Katalaba. Eh, Pakalabando, so Kotolo Godosha. Thank you, Jesus. Eh, Mandara Rabosh, it in the bush. Eh, Pakarabosha. Eh, Pakarabosha. Ze pleke de de bosha ya pantolo godo shele de bosha ze pelala bosha ze pakata la da da bosha le bosha ze pleke de de ke para da bosha ese ke patala bosha Pray in the Holy Ghost. Shake it in the Holy Ghost. Fire on the Holy Ghost. He mantolo so kodobo shele bere bes. Shake it in the payando so kotolo bos. Kalada da da bo shele bo sha.
She said she couldn't sit for more than an hour. Her legs would grow numb, and she couldn't even be in the service. But she's been coming Sunday. The numbness is gone. She's feeling. <laughs> I want to pray for anybody with issues with your leg, your hips, your joints. Just place your hand there wherever you are wherever you are. Because of time, I'm not going to be able to take testimonies, but when you see a difference in your body, please find my wife. Let us know what God is doing so that we can tell the world about the wondrous things of God. Amen. Amen. Put your hand wherever you are hurting. Matter of fact, let's just pray for pain completely. Put your hand wherever you are hurting. Your joints, your back, brand new disc, your vertebrae get straining up. God is doing a chiropractor adjustment on somebody's hip. In the name of Jesus, the hip that is crooked is becoming straight. You will begin to walk normal from tonight in the name of Jesus. Bone to bone. In the mighty name of Jesus. I command every bones to be made straight. Be in alignment with the word of God. I speak to the pain on this left side of this side of your body. I think it's your right left, right side of your body. I speak to that discomfort there. That tightness of your muscle. I speak to that lungs. I speak to every organ in your body that has been plagued with infirmity. You foul spirit of infirmity, I bind you in the name of Jesus. You devil, you know my name. And you know me and you know I did not come in my own name. But I came in the name of Jesus Christ. You must hear me and you must go out of the people of God now in Jesus name. Every problem in your body, 
every affliction in your body, I curse it now in Jesus' name. I command blood diseases to be healed. I command lumps to dissolve. I command cysts to dissolve. In the mighty name of Jesus. Problems with your womb be healed. In the mighty name of Jesus. Problems with your hearing. I speak to every spirit of deafness to let loose of you. I command your ears to be unstuck in the name of Jesus. I speak to that irregular blood flow. In the name of Jesus. Heart problems be healed. Gut problems be healed. In the mighty name of Jesus. I lose the miracle working power of God into your body. And I call it done in the name of Jesus. I declare that Jesus heals you. Jesus makes you whole. Jesus healed you. You are healed by the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. If you believe it, rejoice and give God praise. Somebody shout hallelujah. I want you to begin to check yourself. Do what you couldn't do before. And as you are sitting down, make sure. Just come. Come and tell me. Come. Check yourself. Check yourself. Check yourself. Tell me. I had a bilateral dystectomy of the spine back in 1999 from a work accident nursing, and I always had this lump on the lower right-hand side, and it's completely gone. Give Jesus a shout of praise. It will never return. It will never return. You are healed. And what have I slept to do? I have neuropathy in my legs, but it's going to be healed too. I know it. I know it. Working God. The miracle working God He's the Alpha Hit it, hit it He's, He's a miracle working God yeah. He's a miracle working God He's a miracle working God Mama, what, what is going on here? Yes, my name is Anne Jaga I love Jesus Christ as my personal savior I have a problem with, I had my problem of the spine. Now I don't have it because when the pastor said that we touch our bodies, I had laminectomy done in 2022, whereby I'm supposed to go back uh, to have an epidural injection on Thursday. And then I see a surgeon on, uh, in, on 7th November so that they can see if they can do the operation surgery again. Now when we were told to touch, it was done here. When I went to touch like that, I felt something moving like that, up and down. Yes, I, I, could, I was going like this, but now I feel strong and I, I can sit. Yes. Give Jesus a shout of praise. Scream hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, because of time, I, I told the prophet that I will end at 10. And you can't lie to a prophet. So, so may you be seated. Let me, let me wrap this. Make sure you share your testimonies with my wife so that we can put it on tape and give God all the glory and all the honor. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you to grab hold of this book. This is the first book I wrote. It's just prayer points just to help you pray because the disciples went to Jesus and said, Master, teach us how to pray. Some people want to pray. They don't know how to start, where to start and what to pray. This book will help you. Matter of fact, a few months ago, we had one of the most powerful testimonies we heard in our ministry. A man lost his wife. His wife died. The doctors told him, come into the, the room and come and say the final goodbye to your wife. He took this book and took an anointing oil. He opened, because I have a page that says that husbands pray for your wives. And the reason why I put that in there, because you have a lot of marriage problems. And then I realized that you can't hate someone you are constantly praying for. So that's why I wrote that. That solves marital problems. <laughs> 
So he, he took the book into the room and started praying for the wife. And all of a sudden, life came into the body and the wife came back to life. This is, this is a recorded testimony. I saw, I saw the, the man and the wife about three days ago. On what day, what day is today? The days are all messed up. I saw them on Friday. I saw the husband, the man. I have the video, it's seven minutes. You know, it's too long. I would, I would play it, but it's too long. So God is up to something. God is doing something. So I would encourage you, just get, get it. And then there's other things that are on our table in the back that would help you. I want to encourage you to sow a seed tonight. This is the time of the service. If you are a cheapskate, you pretend you got a phone call. Or if you have a baby, you pinch, you pinch the baby. The baby starts crying. And, <laughs> and then you rush out. We are not judging you. This is a judgment-free zone. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just give it about 30 seconds for all the anti-prosperity people to work out so that we can talk about the blessings of God. Amen. The reason why we take offerings is not to enrich the preachers because God has his, has his way of blessing his people. God has ways of getting blessings to the people. The truth of the matter is that Jesus Christ, the gospel is the answer to the sufferings of all humanities. And the Bible says that how can they believe on whom they've not heard? And how can they hear unless they be a preacher? And how can they be a preacher unless he sends? For beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. See, for the gospel to, to be preached, there is twofold. There is the one that has the microphone and preaches and the ones that send the preacher. So you could either be doing one of those to advance God's kingdom. You could either, hold on, on the, don't fill out anything here. Let me finish. So that you can attach your faith to what you are doing so that you can reap a reward. There is twofold, the one that preaches and the ones that send the preacher. You know, I had the privilege of meeting Kenneth Copeland, which... I've, in all my life, I've never posted a picture with any man of God where people were, are writing nasty things in the comments. And you don't know that man. People are saying he's the devil. He's a Satan himself. And people know nothing about him. All because he told people that God wants to bless you. Do you want him to tell you that God wants to curse you? <laughs> you know, people are funny. But what they don't know was that this man spent his life advancing God's kingdom. You know, we watch Ryan Bonke. We say, oh, praise God. Ryan Bonke is a soul winner. He's not about prosperity. He doesn't preach about uh, sowing and reaping. You know why Ryan Bonke never preached about sowing and reaping? Because there was a man called Kenneth Copeland preaching about sowing and reaping and sending millions of dollars to fund his crusades. You know, Ryan, um, Kenneth Copeland spent $60 million dollars on Ryan Bonke for the nine years that he was in Nigeria. Nobody knows that. Nobody talks about that. So then it's easy for people to insult him. When Mike Murdoch was needed a surgery, was about almost dying, it was Kenneth Copeland's plane that flew him from Dallas to Houston for his, sur his life-saving surgery. Nobody talks about that. Or oh, why do preachers have a plane? To help others that are dying. The truth of the matter is that the devil's will is to impoverish the church. Because people with money are the ones that rules and makes decisions. The Bible says that when the, when the wicked prospers, it is the righteous that suffers. So as long as the devil's children are prospering, they would make laws and shove things down our throat that we would have no... You know, look at what is... Look at COVID. Look at the things that happened. The whole world was shut down. You couldn't fly. But if you had your own plane, you could have flown everywhere you wanted. You understand what I'm saying? That is the power of being blessed. Where you are not controlled by the things that control this world. You know, I have a friend that is very wealthy. The Lord has blessed him very much. He's in South Carolina. When the hurricane hit and everything was off, he took it. 
him and his family and a few friends rented a big, he called me, rented, I'm worried about him. And this guy was living in a huge Airbnb in a, what is the name, that nice place in South Carolina, where's my wife? She always runs away. There's that nice resort in South Carolina. They were there living, living it up. Left everything, left his house, his mansion in South Carolina. There was no lights. You know, he was not worried about the $700 that the U.S. government is dishing out to people that are suffering while they are sending trillions of dollars to Ukraine. That is what poverty does. Where you are paying taxes to your government and your government is funding wicked agendas in foreign nations, and when you need your government, your government turns their back yeah. on you. But when you are financially sound, you don't need your government. So your government cannot tell you what to do. Amen. Your government cannot dictate terms to you. Right. So when the church, as long as the church is poor, the church would always be relegated to the back. The church would always be at the mercy of the government. The Bible said that there was a poor man in a town who knew who, he was in a town that was under siege and the poor man had answers how to bring the town out of the siege that they were under. But the Bible said that no one listened to him because of his poverty. You see, poverty would, for, would cause you to be silenced. Your wisdom will not be regarded. Your wisdom will not be regarded. And the Bible said that even when they heard him, and he brought the town into safety. They still did not give credit to him. That is why God said that I have stored up the riches of the wicked and laid it up for the just. But the problem with it is that the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. So before God would entrust one person with wealth, God must know that your, the wealth will not change your heart from him. Because God loves you so much. God wants you to go to heaven. So God is more concerned about your eternity than your millions. But if you can prove to God that money does not have a hold in your heart, but money has a hold in your hands, then God can also entrust you with wealth. That's why he said that the measure you give, he shall measure it back unto you. Because the scripture said in the book of Isaiah, they said, Lord, Lord, with your mouth, but your heart is far away from me. So you can come here and sing praises to your name. But the proof of where a man's heart is is where his treasure is. You can show, I can tell you what you are in love with by just looking at your bank statement. Whatever you invest in is where your heart is. Some of you, you love your car more than your wife. Because you never bought anything for your wife, but you always buy new, th new additions, accessories to put on your car. It's true. You can, you know, if you're married to a woman, and I'm not trying to destroy anybody's marriage here, but you just have to take the advice and correct it. If you're married to a woman and you've never done anything, you know, year one, honey, I love you. You never bought her anything. You never did anything nice to her, for her. Year two, honey, I love you. You never bought her anything. You never did anything nice for her. Year three, I love you. And you never bought her anything. You never, at some point, when you come and say, honey, I love you, she will say that, stop lying. Because love, because you cannot, love is not a substance, but we, we prove love by what we do, our actions. You know, you can tell somebody that you love them. What shows that you love them? Love is just worse. But love is expressed by what we do. Love is expressed by what we give. For God so loved the world. What is the proof of God's love for the world? He gave. So your giving is a reflex, it's a proof of your love towards God. Your giving is a proof of your love towards God. And God says that when you express your love to me and I know that your heart is with me, I can also open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can contain. Because then God knows that money does not have your heart, it's just in your hands. And God can bless you. So, you know, in meetings like this, what do you do? You want to show God, God, I see what you are doing. I know that this is what the world, this is what America needs. And I know this is how much I believe that Jesus Christ is the answer to all the sufferings of humanity. I do something. You know, for me and my wife, we've made so many, so many sacrifices. 
It's not just in words. I'm telling you, we are not, it's not just, I'm not coming here to tell you, listen, this, my, what I, the offering you give me is not what makes, makes me prosperous. My giving is what blesses me, causes God to bless me. Because let me tell you, we've worked in a restaurant where we are just going to eat, somebody hands us $10,000. It's not a matter of, it's, it's not a, we didn't preach, we didn't take offering. It's because of our giving. My giving positions me for the blessings of God. I told you here yesterday, I got a call, somebody dropped off an escalate for you at the office. Mind you, you have no idea how much seed I have sown. I give away, I've given about five cars because I was believing God for an SUV. You know what? When what is in your hands is not enough, it must be a seed. I gave. I gave. I remember when I was getting married to my wife. I had $100 in my bank account. I'm planning a wedding in three weeks. You know, I decided on April 28th, we are getting married. My wife said, when do you want to get married? I said, May 17th. Three weeks. People were calling me, why? Are you okay? You have, I have no money. Matter of fact, I wasn't even in the country for most of those three weeks. $100, I was sitting, I sat in the hotel room. I began to weep. I said, God, I am a giver. And I'm telling you, when I finished with the wedding, I had more money than I did, than I've ever had in my life. Because God's word is true. God's word, he said that he gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. As long as you commit to the advancement of the kingdom of God, you will never lack anything. You know, the, the beauty about giving is that whatever you give, God empowers you to conquer. Whatever amount you give, God empowers you to conquer. That is the beauty about giving because giving would forever increase you. Amen. When you give $1,000 for the first time, it might be the sacrifice, but afterwards $1,000 becomes easy. When you give $10,000 for the first time, it might be a sacrifice, but afterwards $10,000 becomes easy. And that's how it has been. We are always pressing. Every year I increase what we give. And every year the Lord increases us. I tried it one year. I said, this year I'm not going to increase it. This is, true. this is my testimony. You can believe me or you don't believe me. That year I didn't increase what we gave. And that year there was no increase in our life. We stayed the same. It's the word of God. So at some point you must expand your capacity. Go forth. Do what you haven't done before. And say, Lord, I'm believing you. Because your word says that if I give, you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. You, you know what giving is all about? Giving is about trust. Abraham trusted God. That's why he had no problem sacrificing Isaac. The Bible said that Abraham believed that God was going to raise Isaac back from the ashes. In Hebrews chapter, I believe, either chapter 11 or chapter 12. Chapter 12, Abraham believed that God was going to raise Isaac out of the ashes. That's why he didn't hesitate to put a knife to his throat and was ready to sacrifice him. He trusted God because he knows that God will not take from you for you to be without. If God asks for it, it's because he has a bigger blessing for you. The reason why it is so difficult to give sacrificially is because we don't have trust for God. What if I give $10,000? What am I going to eat tomorrow? I remember my wife called, told me she, she was pregnant. I don't know by who, but she told me she was pregnant. <laughs> and I looked at my bank account, my savings account, and I looked at my ministry account. The money that was there was not enough to take care of a child. So... In August, around August 4th, Bishop Takiya Boy was in Maryland. I went to the meeting, took everything that was my ministry account, and I sold it. September 2nd, Bishop Dag was in New Jersey. I took everything that was in my savings account and sold it. Just imagine hearing that you're about to have a child. Let the piano go down a little bit. But I, I like the sound. Good job. Just imagine you're about to have a child. The natural thing to do is to start saving money, start gathering money. But the Bible says that he who gathers would himself would be poor. And who, who, he who scatters would have plenty. That's the scriptures. So I scattered. And I'm telling you, it wasn't much. Maybe my ministry account was about $1,500. Just 
Personal account was about $2,000. That wasn't much. That's not any money to take care of a child. Can't even buy five boxes of diapers in, in, this account, in this government's economy. Maybe before it could have, but now it cannot. Now gas is like ridiculous. Man, I miss those days when gas was like $2. Don't you miss those days? Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so I sold it. And you know what about giving? In, that was in September, August and September of 2019. In 2020, the Lord blessed us so much. In 2020, in January, you know, the whole year of 2019, probably the sowing we sold was not up to $10,000. In 2020 of January, from January 1st, before January 21st, we had already given over $10,000 in offering. And that's when things began to change for us. That's when it changed because of the sacrifice. Sometimes you must break the alabaster flask. Break it. Give. We bought a car in Ghana. A 20, at that time, was a 2017 Honda CRV. We bought it for ministry. Had 22,000 miles on it. Almost brand new. Very nice car. I drove the car for one week. The Lord spoke to me. I realized, you know, where we were going, we needed a car that was stronger and heavier. Good car. And that car is a good, nice car, good on fuel, but it couldn't go in the terrains that we needed it to go to. So I, the Lord spoke to me, it must be, if it's not enough, then it must be a seed. I called one pastor friend of mine. I didn't know what was going on in his life. I said, hey, I have a car for you. Go pick it up. He started crying. You know, he later told me that there were issues with their marriage because he was so focused on building the church. He didn't have a house. He didn't have anything. And he was just putting everything in the church. And the wife, you know, because men live, are very reckless. Women are very, they plan, strategic. What are we going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do next week? Which is good. You need a wife like that. So the wife began to plan for their future. We don't even have a house. But you put all this money in the church. What are we going to do? And then all of a sudden, the Lord blessed them with a brand new car. He called me and said, you saved my marriage. He said, now my wife said that I know God will take care of us. He said, because all the money we, we have made, we couldn't have bought this car. See, your giving becomes answers to somebody's prayers. Then God would also answer your prayer by sending somebody to you. So giving is a total and complete trust. Little did I know that there was an, a nice escalade waiting for me. And you know the other blessing? I don't pay insurance and I don't pay gas for that car. That's the truth. The person said, anytime you want to buy gas, use this card. And the insurance is paid for. That's the truth. That's the blessings of the Lord. So, whatever you are going to give tonight, it, you saw the crusade videos. We are planning another, we are work, as we speak now, there are people on the ground working on another crusade, hopefully in March. You know, normally we don't announce the dates on, until we know for sure that it's going to come up because crusade planning is different than the church conference. You don't know if it's going to work. You go to different places and see which one would work. So, there are people on the ground. I just hired five people in Ghana on food that we pay them every month. And every December, we feed how about hundreds of families in my mother's hometown. So what you are giving tonight, that is what it's going to go to. I want you to ask the Lord, what would be a seed of sacrifice? The Bible says that they that sow sparingly shall reap sparingly. But they that sow bountifully shall reap with shouts of joy. When was the last time you broke your alabaster flask? When was the last time you did something sacrificial? You went above and beyond. You did something in faith. David said that I will not give to the Lord anything that did not cost me. You see, you must give a seed that when you are giving it, your left hand wants to pull it out of your right hand. That is what you know that is a seed of sacrifice. Where your mind is doubting you, that's when you know that it's a seed of sacrifice. And God said that when you do it, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you can contain. There are, you know, this is, there are, you know, in this room, there are people that can do a seed of $10,000. There are people that can do, if, you, if God has blessed your business and you can do more, do it. Attach your business to the advancement of the kingdom of God. 
and see what God will do for you. Because individual, personal seed will bring personal increase. Business seed will bring business increase. You know, we have to pay tight from our ministry. We have to sow from our ministry. We have to pay tight personally and sow personally. And we've seen that when we sow personally, we reap personally. And when we sow from the ministry, we reap from the ministry. So if God has blessed you with a business, ask God what would be a seed of sacrifice and do it. And I also want to ask you if you, can, if you would prayerfully consider partnering with us on a monthly basis that says something aside. You, you know, you partner with a cable company. Why don't you partner with a ministry, a soul winning ministry? You partner with AT&T and Verizon. Why don't you partner with a soul winning ministry? There is this leaflet on our table. You can grab it and it will tell you what to do. If you are writing out a check, you can just write WEM or you can write Word Evangelistic on it. There are other ways to give. You can give on PayPal, Cash App, uh, Venmo. You can mail in a check to P.O. Box 15589, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If you are writing, if you are spelling out a million, it's spelled M-I-L-L-I-O-N. If your eyebrows went really wide, I'm not talking to you. If you spell out a thousand, T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D. Whatever amount you want to give, just add an extra zero. <laughs> if you need an envelope, just lift up your hands and the ushers will give you an envelope. I'm going to give you a few moments. Tomorrow, I said I was going to pray for everyone tonight, but I, I didn't intend to preach long and I preached long tonight. But tomorrow, I'm going to make a promise. I'm going to lay hands on everyone that comes tomorrow. And God, you know, everything with God builds up. So tomorrow is going to even be better. Just like tonight was, tonight is better than it was yesterday. Tomorrow is going to be better. It's just going to keep increasing. It's just going to keep increasing. And, you know, like in our crusade, in our meeting, somebody came the first night, didn't receive their miracle. Second night, didn't receive their miracle. And received in the last night. There was a lady, you know, I'll probably play the, some more testimonies tomorrow. But I want you to come expecting. Set your faith up. And come expecting and believing God for a total transformation. Whatever the issue is, you are one prayer away from seeing the hand of God completely turn your case around. Your case will be different in Jesus' name. If, if, you've, if you are ready, just lift up your offering to the Lord and let me pray over it. Father, I thank you for your children and I thank you for their faith in response to your word concerning sowing and reaping. I pray that as they have stepped out in faith to do what your word commands, I pray that let every promise concerning sowing and reaping manifest in their life. Open the windows of heaven over their life. Bless them. Increase them tremendously. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I'll just you go ahead and receive the offering. You remember I told you a testimony about when we were doing our crusade and we had no money. And then one man of God called me when I had prayed to God and God said, plan as if you have the money. And I said, one man of God called me and said that how many, the Lord just spoke to me to pay for your transportation when you are in Ghana. How many cars do you need? And then I got to the airport and he had five land cruisers waiting for me with police escort, with a welcoming team. People were dancing and drumming, wearing a t-shirt. That's, that's the, the man of God right here. And he came all the way from Belgium. Come and greet the people. Just come. He, he is a prophet. You know what? Just, just pick one person and prophesy to this. Church, let us say amen. amen. Family, clap your hands together for Jesus. Amen. Somebody can do better. If God has been good, clap your hands. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right. So our man of God here is very anointed, very gifted, and very humble. I think the Lord brought him into my life at a very season where things were so bad, and it's been a blessing. I'm really shocked with the testimony he just gave about me actually helping the ministry. Meanwhile, the Lord spoke to me about a conference in Africa well, five years ago when I had nothing in our bank accounts. He called and then gave us $5,000. And that's how the Lord began to give us increase on every side. So once again, clap your hands, church. I'm telling you, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. I, I told him, the man of God, whatever I would have to do to come around, I will come around just to support the word of the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. 
I believe as you come tomorrow, the healing will be complete. And all that God has said will come to pass in the name of Jesus. Somebody say glory to God. All right, now wave your hands to God and close your eyes in two seconds. And just begin to thank the Lord for every miracle he has done tonight. Just thank him. Just thank him. Just thank him. And ask the Lord to speak to you in the next two seconds. In the next, just, just thank the Lord. Just thank the Lord. Just thank the Lord. Just thank the Lord. Begin to thank the Lord for this presence. Thank the Lord for the atmosphere. Thank God for everything he's doing here. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. Ikobo sherete leva haskiti ni miataya. Vehede ne mosk faharanante. Ikaban tu varante le me haski visu asanana shaya. Ilikubrist vehele maski vahanana skufaya. Ivelest vahaya ne nimi fri haskatolo mosas. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. We give you glory. We give you glory. In the name of Jesus, let us say amen. In the course of the prayer, the Lord just spoke to me right now. From look at me, the Lord just told me that I should tell somebody in the worship team that the Lord is about to transform all that concerns you. I don't know what you are believing God for, but the Lord says that after tonight, you are going to see the glory of the Lord. In the course of the prayer, I heard in my ears a name like Lily, like L I double L I E. Who is that? Who is that? Two of them. So can we prophesy here? Say prophesy. Amazing. What's your name? Vivian what? And who and you? Are you sisters? Wow. Wow. This is powerful. I hear Rebecca. Oh, oh Chevelle Mask. Hey, yeah, yeah. Because God told me that I should call all the... I, I had Vivian, I had Rebecca, I had... It's powerful. It's powerful. It's powerful. It's powerful. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The Lord says I should speak over your lives. That everything he said about your destiny will come to pass. I'm telling you. The Lord has been telling me that back ago when they used to do... One of the things to do was like martial, martial arts. And I see myself in a place like Zishal Martial Arts. Oh, this is powerful. I very tell the kufa, I say mantos. Somebody clap your hands together for Jesus. <laughs> My God. My God. This is powerful. The Lord spoke to me that the enemy has been doing everything possible to make sure that you will have doubts about what God has told you concerning your life. And the Lord says, in the next few months of your destiny, everything will be well. And the Lord says, from today, goodness and mercy shall follow you. Somebody clap your hands together for Jesus. My God. My God. Lift up your hands. Somebody say, glory to God. I speak over your life. You are going to see the name of God expressing your destiny. Somebody say, hallelujah. Watch this. Well, I wish I had time today. <laughs> but hear this. Um, right now, as I began to pray, I don't know why I just heard God telling me this. But funny enough, I had a name like Deb, D-E-B, 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 something like Deb in my ears. I don't know why God told me that, but the Lord told me to pray for this very person for two reasons. The Lord told me to speak healing over the life of this very person here. I don't know why God told me that. But the Lord told me the enemy would want to put this person in operation, whereby for some reasons, the doctors will fail in what they do. But the Lord says this encounter is opening you up to a blessing and manifestation. So whatever it is, God says it is done with your soul in the name of Jesus. Family, the Lord richly bless you and God keep you alive. So I'm going to say glory to, glory to God. Give Jesus a hand clap. <laughs> Father, we thank you. We bless your name. Tomorrow, don't miss it. Amen. Amen. I want you to welcome the most handsome the most handsome, I call him the wind. The Bible says that the wind bloweth where it listed. You hear the sound thereof. But you know it nowhere where it goeth or where it cometh from. So it's anyone that is born of the Spirit. I want you to welcome Pastor Brian. Yeah.